Hello and welcome to the Lunaverse Virtual Planetarium from Lancaster University. The following is a recording of one of our free live public shows that we ran during early 2021. I hope you enjoy. We'll start at the very centre of our solar system with the Sun. It is by far the largest body in the solar system. And this large body, this large mass, means that the other planets orbit the Sun at different distances, which we'll see in just a second. Whilst we're here, though, it's actually worth noting that the gravitational pull of the other planets has an effect on the Sun's orbit. If you were to watch the Sun for a little while, you'd actually notice it wobble slightly back and forth. This is because the Sun is actually being pulled by the gravity of the other planets. The Sun actually orbits what we call the barycenter of the universe, of, of the solar system, sorry. It just so happens that the barycenter is actually inside the Sun. So it just sort of wobbles about a little bit. Anyway, let's move out slightly and have a look at the next planet. Well, the first planet, which would be Mercury, out on this part of the orbit here. Mercury is, of course, the closest planet to the Sun, meaning it has the shortest year and it has the fastest orbital speed. Next out, of course, is Venus, which is, although slightly further away from the Sun than Mercury, is actually hotter than Mercury due to the greenhouse effect because of its thick atmosphere. A step further out from that then becomes our home planet, Earth. We'll be coming back to Earth and the Moon in just a little bit when we talk a little bit more about the Moon and how it's tidally locked. And then finally, for the inner planets, another step out is Mars. Already, though, I like to try and point out the scale that we're talking about here. You can already see just how large things are by how small our sun currently looks. This massive, massive object is now becoming a tiny speck and we've only reached Mars. A little bit further out, we then managed to get to the asteroid belt. And this is Ceres, which is a dwarf planet inside the asteroid belt. We have to go even further if we want to have a look at Jupiter, which is Leisha's specialty. After Jupiter, we can then move out onto Saturn. Following Saturn, we then get to Uranus, 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 up to you. The next one out is then Neptune, which you can already now see just the scale of the solar system. The difference between the outer planets and the inner planets is absolutely massive. It's why they have such long years. In fact, all those inner planets seem very small and bunched up now in comparison. And then finally, outside, we have the famous dwarf planet, Pluto. This is actually a good opportunity to show why Pluto is a dwarf planet, because if we have a look, there actually are many different objects at a similar distance to Pluto, all orbiting our sun. I just think that's pretty interesting. We'll have a quick side note here by doing a couple of clicks and going over to the moon. So last week we were talking about how the moon is tidally locked, which means the same side always faces the Earth. We only ever get to see one half of the moon's surface. The other half, known as the dark side of the moon, is always facing away from us. But if you look here, you can see, of course, that the moon does rotate. And the way a planet is tidally locked is that its rotation period matches its orbital period. So from this bizarre space of person, bird's eye sort of view, you can still see how the moon is actually a rotating object. Likewise, if I then make it so that the Earth stays in the centre, and I've got to do this and not mess this up, which is actually a little harder than I always think it's going to be, you can actually see how if I keep the Earth in the centre, which is basically equivalent from standing on the Earth and watching the moon, how the moon looks like it's always facing the same spot. So even though it's still rotating, because it's moving around the Earth at a fixed time, if we keep the Earth in the centre, the moon doesn't look like it's rotating anymore. As well as that, you can actually see how the phases of the moon come about by how the sun's light is reflected off it, which parts are currently in line with the sun, as in being shone on, and which parts are being shadowed by it. Like so. I just think it's a nice little demonstration of the differences between 
a tidily locked object and one that isn't. Fab. We'll head back over to that solar system simulation because what we can do is also have a little look at all the relative scales. Now, this is my favourite thing about this system, although I do need to do that first. We can actually have a look at just how big the sun is in comparison to our planets. These are small asteroids, dwarf planets, etc. But if we have a look, at least on some form of attempted scale by the simulation, just how large the sun is in comparison to these other planets, as well as how large the planets are in comparison to each other. This is currently sorted by mass. We can also sort it by diameter. So hopefully that's given you a little refresher on our solar system and a chance to have uh, write in a few questions that we can start asking the very sensible expert, Leisha, who I will now hand over to, and Pascal, who's going to be asking Leisha our questions today. Over to you two. OK, so the first question that we have is, if all the planets lined up, could they wobble the centre of gravity outside of the sun? Hello, now that I'm unmuted, this, this will hopefully work better. That is an excellent question. So the planets don't actually need to be lined up to wobble the center of gravity of the solar system outside of the sun. So I don't know if Andrew's planetarium has a path of the sun's orbit. Um, I am going to ask him to check that and he can check that while I'm chatting with you. So the planet that the sun's motion corresponds the most to is Jupiter. Jupiter is the most massive planet in our solar system and it has the strongest gravitational effect on the sun. And the sun, its motion in its little local area is greater than one solar radius. So it does move around a bit and trace out a nice pattern. Um, so the planets do not need to be lined up to do that. They do line up every so often. It's a very rare occurrence. Uh, but because Jupiter's mass is so much greater than the rest, that dominates in any event. All right, what is the next question, Pascal? So the next question is, what would happen if a solid planetary body the size of Jupiter existed in the solar system? What would its characteristics be? So which, uh, right. So what would happen if a solid planetary body the size of Jupiter existed and what would the characteristics be? It would be very difficult for a solid planetary body the size of Jupiter to exist. And the reason why is that that requires a lot of, of solid material um, to be at the right location and to, um, to, to stick together and then to accrete even more material and more material um, and get to a, <clears throat> a size that, that is stable. So Jupiter may have a solid object in the center of it. Um, and then once a solid object gets to a certain size in the solar system, it then starts to have enough mass to gravitationally attract um, gas and dust. And since the protoplanetary nebula was made of a bunch of stuff, so dust, debris, um, solid elements, if you were close to the sun, uh, and then more gaseous elements, ice, ices, it, it's tricky to get something up to that size. So I'm going to do a hard sidestep the question because it's not likely to happen. OK, so next up we have which planetary systems would you like to see missions sent to next and what sort of missions fly by, orbiter, etc.? I am unmuted. So um, this, I could be greedy here. My favorite planet is Jupiter by far. Uh, I think it is the most exciting. It has some fantastic aurora. It's got fascinating moons. It has a nice volcanic moon. The most uh, volcanically active body in the solar system is Io, and that is embedded within Jupiter's magnetic bubble, the magnetosphere. Um, 
so it's always fun to go to the Jovian system, but if we go back, we really need to go with multiple spacecraft this time. And the nice thing is if you can get a mission with multiple spacecraft, and we call those constellation missions in the field, then you can start to do some really cool things. And you can, um, one, you can get some nice, camera pictures if you're interested in, in looking at the planet and the moons. You can get images of, of the body from different vantage points at the same time. If you're interested in magnetic fields and electric fields um, and particles, then you can measure those quantities. Uh, and because you can measure them with multiple spacecraft at the same time, you can start to figure out what's changing the system uh, and figure out what's causing those changes. But I don't always want to be greedy. Um, so it, it would be great to go to Jupiter. I think it would be really nice to go to either Uranus or Neptune. We haven't had a proper mission yet to one of the ice giants in our solar system. So that is a whole class of objects that is relatively undiscovered um, and unexplored. It's not undiscovered because we know that they're there. Uh, so it would be great to go out to one of the ice giants and understand more about them. And then I really would love to send something out like the Voyagers again, only in the opposite direction if possible. So the Voyager missions were fantastic. They went through uh, the entire solar system. They flew past a number of objects, but they're getting some great data about what our local interstellar space is. And, um, how our, our what our heliosphere is like what the heliosphere is is that is the space carved out by the sun's influence um within our galaxy within our little area of the galaxy so i think it would be fascinating to really understand the shape and the structure of of that bubble that the sun has carved out okay thank you for that uh, the next question is, is it possible for something to be orbiting the sun in a similar orbit to the Earth, but directly opposite us so that we are unaware of it because we can't see it because of the glare of the sun? OK, so is it possible for something to be orbiting the sun in a similar orbit? So presumably this is hinting at um, the mysterious planet that is sometimes alluded to in science fiction movies uh, and, and stories, that there's this, this dark planet somewhere. We would be able to detect an object like that. So um, first off, we have plenty of spacecraft and satellite now, satellites now that are throughout the solar system. They have imagers on them. Uh, so it's not that we can see everything, but we can see a lot more than we used to, and we would be able to detect a, a planet or something large like that. We're constantly discovering new asteroids, so if there were something small out and dark that didn't really emit any radiation or much radiation, maybe that is, is something that could sneak by, but nothing, nothing huge. Um, and if something were gravitationally significant, so if it had a large mass, then we would be able to detect that in the motion of objects near us in the solar system. So locally at an orbit similar to the Earth, we're not going to be missing anything, anything significant. OK, next we have how do all of the objects in our solar system stay in place? All right, so how do the objects in our solar system stay in place? That is gravity. So gravity is fantastic. It does a lot for us. Um, which is nice, I suppose, if you like walking on the ground and not, uh, you know, just not walking in the ground. <laughs> if you like to be able to jump and not jump for days and days, then gravity is fantastic. Uh, so when the solar system was formed, and I think this is going to go up uh, and tie into a question by Alex earlier on how the sun was made. So the sun was made, uh, was formed out of a protostellar nebula. So there was a large gas cloud in space. Um, and what happens is these, these nebulae, they exist. And when they get to a certain critical mass in their local area, uh, then they start to condense. So they get enough mass comes into a certain volume that that gas, that dust in that nebular cloud, 
it starts to shrink, condense upon itself and collapse. As it does this, it starts to spin up. So the cloud isn't just out there in interstellar space, not moving, it's orbiting the center of our galaxy. So it has some motion associated with it. Um, and as it shrinks, any of its motion in the rotational direction is gonna spin up. So you can think of what happens when you have figure skaters um, in the Olympics, which didn't happen this year, sadly. So, um, but I'm sure you can Google up a good figure skating routine in your spare time. And so you can see these figure skaters with their arms well out. And then as they're spinning around, they bring their arms in close and they start spinning around faster. So the same thing happens. Now you can imagine that cloud of gas is coming in. It's condensing. It's starting to spin up faster. And then you can start to think about what happens when things spin. So what happens when a fluid might spin? And if you spin something up, you can imagine um, now thinking about what happens when you see a cartoon and I'm going to say a cartoon, not because it doesn't happen in real life, but because it's more exaggerated when it's in the com in cartoons of somebody making pizza, right? And they have pizza dough and they throw it up and they spin it. And that dough starts to spin out and form into a thin disk. So we now have our gas cloud, which got big enough that it started to condense and compress, started to spin. And as it spun faster, it then started to thin out into a nice pizza crust. Um, and within that pizza crust, you get the planets and at the center, there's still a bulge and that is our sun. So we have our sun in the center. That's the most massive object and that is composed predominantly of hydrogen and helium. And at a certain point, especially our sun, it's a, it's a middle class star. Um, our, at some point, it sets off some reactions that fuse hydrogen into helium that produce quite a lot of energy. And then out in the disk itself, the material in the disk, which is now some, some solids, you have elements like uh, carbon, oxygen, um, iron, nickel. These will create larger molecules and larger clumps. These clumps will clump together to form pebbles. The pebbles will clump together to form rocks. The rocks will clump together and so on and so forth until you get planets. And they're all spinning around the sun and they're all bound to the sun by gravitational forces. All right, so what is next? Next we have, uh, what would happen if the Earth was the closest planet to the sun? <laughs> um, we would all need to invest in some sun cream stocks. So, uh, we would be we would be quite hot um if the earth so there's there's two ways to um interpret this so uh one is sorry and i can't see the questions that question anymore let me just see if all right oh, sorry um, i removed no it. no that's okay so i i'm not sure if the question is what would happen if the Earth were the closest planet to the sun, as in if the Earth were near Mercury were where sorry, near Mercury's orbit, um, or if there just weren't any other planets in between us and the sun. So um, if there weren't any other planets, if Venus and Mercury just disappeared tomorrow, then that would probably have some consequences uh, for our orbit just in terms of a, a change in the balance within the solar system and the gravitational forces. But since Venus and Mercury are, are fairly inconsequential compared to Jupiter and Saturn in terms of gravity within the solar system, I, I can't tell you exactly how our orbit would change, but I would say not by very much. If the Earth were all of a sudden transported over to Mercury, um, we would be quite a bit hotter. Um, our atmosphere would be more expanded. There would be more energy in the system. It would, it would poof up more. We might lose some of our atmosphere uh, to space um, because the, the local conditions that affect our magnetic bubble that protects us from a lot of the negative effects of interstellar space and helps protect our atmosphere, there would be a different balance there. So I, I don't think we'd enjoy the move. Um, 
we're already complaining about how hot the summers are getting sometimes. All right, next question. Next question is, if there is no oxygen in space, how is the sun still burning? Ah, that is excellent. So if there's no oxygen in space, how is the sun still burning? The sun, we always say the sun burns and that one day the sun's going to burn out. Uh, but it's very different to how a candle burns or how a campfire burns. So, and you're absolutely correct. When we burn candles, when we burn campfires, um, when we do that, the fire needs oxygen. Uh, and without oxygen, it wouldn't burn. In space, the sun burning is through a process called nuclear fusion. So that's a bit different. So the sun is composed of mostly hydrogen atoms and helium atoms, um, but mostly hydrogen. Helium's gonna be important in a couple sentences. So hydrogen is the most basic type of atom and it's the simplest type of atom. And when you get four hydrogen together, they uh, they fuse, so they, they can under intense pressure, um, they can fuse into helium atoms. And so helium atoms now have two protons um, and two neutrons instead of uh, one proton and one neutron and um, helium atoms uh, the X the consequence of that reaction is that the helium atoms not only do they get fused from the hydrogen atoms but there's also some energy that's put out from that reaction and that energy from that reaction is what fuels the sun so it's not burning per se, but it's fusing its material together into something else. So right now it's about 90% hydrogen and 10% helium. And with time, the hydrogen fraction, it gets smaller and the helium fraction increases and grows. Okay, thanks. So next question is, is it true that if there was no moon, we wouldn't have waves? So we do, our tides are largely due to the moon and our waves are largely due to the moon. So the interesting thing, and this all gets back to gravity, there's a lot, a lot of gravity going on in the solar system, is this. So the moon orbits the Earth and it orbits the Earth once a month, roughly. Um, so, I'm trying to think of a way to do this without a whiteboard. I didn't bring a whiteboard with me. Right, okay. So we have the Earth here and we have the moon here. It's smaller. You can't tell because my hands are roughly the same size. I got a puppy. We have the Earth here and we have the moon here. And the moon very slowly orbits around the Earth. And the Earth rotates once every day, right? So that's why we have day and night, is because you can imagine for half the day we're facing towards the sun or the sun's in our line of sight, and the other half of the day we're facing away. So the Earth rotates, and you could consider the moon fixed in one place over the course of a day. And the moon is going to pull on the Earth with its gravity, and the Earth is going to pull on the moon. But the side of the Earth that's closest to the moon experiences a stronger pull than the side of the Earth that's farther away from the moon. And the difference in those pulls creates tides and it, we don't notice it when we're standing on the ground because our ground is rigid and it's fairly strong and stable. So if you jumped off your front stoop into the ground, nothing much would happen. Right, you just go, ah, if you jump off your front stoop into a, a paddling pool, the water goes splash. So the water is what can respond to the stronger pull of gravity from the moon on one side to the other. And so because of that, we end up with waves and we end up with tides in our oceans. Just so everybody can see, um, there's a dog here. So if it looks like my arms are weird, that's why. Okay, next question. 
Next we have, uh, would you be able to grow a plant on Venus? There isn't any water on Venus, so the plant would probably not survive. Um, also, there is plenty of carbon dioxide, so it would have something to breathe, but I think plants as we know it on Earth, they would struggle to survive on Venus. Also, the pressures at the ground on Venus are extremely intense. So if you were on Venus, you would feel like you were being crushed by, by quite a lot of material because there's just so much air there. It's thick, it's pea soup level of thick um, or, or more. So the plant would have to be exceptionally strong to, to make it out of the ground. And it would definitely have to use something else for energy than what the plants on Earth use. All right, next question. So next one is, hi, Leisha, loving the explanations. A question, as the sun slowly burns out, will it lose gravitational pull and will we start to lose planets within our solar system? All right, good question. So as the sun slowly burns out, will it lose gravitational pull? So as the sun slowly burns out, um, it's fusing that hydrogen into helium. And so even though a little bit of that helium is turned into energy in that, or sorry, the hydrogen is turned into energy during that process, um, the, the mass of the sun isn't going to significantly change uh, over its lifetime. What will happen at some point is that the gravitational forces of the sun the pressure pushing outwards from that gas is going to become more um, strong. So that'll be stronger and it'll push the solar out atmosphere out. And so eventually we're going to be engulfed by the sun's atmosphere. But that's a long, 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 long time away, billions and billions of years away. So we don't need to worry about that. But I don't expect that we'll start to lose planets in the solar system. Next up, we have um, what would happen if the Earth had no atmosphere? Oh, we'd be very sad indeed. Um, so if the Earth had no atmosphere, we, we wouldn't be able to breathe. Uh, and and we'd, well, we'd need some space suits. So uh, much like if you go to visit the moon, you need some protective equipment. You need an oxygen canister and a nice helmet. Um, we would be in a similar situation. If we had no atmosphere, our plant life, animals wouldn't wouldn't be doing well. Um, and we would end up being, well, like an asteroid, probably just a bit boring and empty. Next question. Is it true that the sun is lots of different colors? If so, why can't we see them all? Ah. Great. So when we look up at the sun, we see something that's, first of all, never look at the sun. Sorry. I should always say that after I say, if you look at the sun, don't look at the sun. You'll burn your eyes out. All right. So if you look nearest to the sun, but not at the sun, um, it appears yellow in the sky, yellowish, but the, the color that we uh, that the sun is emitting this most strongly at is actually at green. So the sun emits and it's called um, black body radiation. And the wavelengths that any object emits are dependent on the temperature of that object. So the sun is a very hot object. Uh, so that means, fortunately for us, at the temperature that the sun is, it emits light most strongly in green, but over the visible spectrum the most strongly. Right now, you, as you are typing into your computer, you are emitting radiation, but you're emitting radiation in the infrared. So that is wavelengths that are longer than visible wavelengths. But if you were using a camera that could see heat or infrared radiation, then you would glow in that. So the sun does emit at all different wavelengths, but the majority, of that is in green wavelengths, and um, but we see it as slightly yellow. All right, um, 
my husband's going to get that door so we can take the next question. Next we have, uh, which planets would humans be able to survive on the longest with their current climates? Earth. <laughs> so we better take care of it because we're a bit stuffed if we don't. Um, so, so in terms of current climate, Venus way too hot, uh, way too acidic. We wouldn't survive. Mercury doesn't have much of an atmosphere, so to speak, so we wouldn't do well there. Mars, the atmosphere is too thin, so we would need support. Um, and it's cold. Mars is a cold planet. It also doesn't have a very, well, it doesn't have an active magnetic field. And I've mentioned these magnetic bubbles previously, and these magnetic bubbles are really important from sheltering the things on the planet from the local space environment. So without that magnetosphere at Mars, uh, we, would, we would have some issues with the radiation environment. Um, Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune are gas and ice giants. So if we were to live on those planets, there isn't a surface and we would need some cloud cities, uh, which could be fun, but I don't think the technology is there yet. Now, we might be able to consider some moons. Um, the best candidate for a moon to live on is actually Titan. So it's the largest moon of Saturn. Um, but the interesting thing about Titan, well, what's interesting is that it's the most Earth-like body out there. Uh, it has lakes and rivers on its surface, but they're not water-based. So the chemistry would be different, and I think we'd struggle. There's not much oxygen. Um, so, so we're going to have to stick locally for a while. Next up, what would happen if a planet crashes into the sun? Uh, we would have to say goodbye to the planet. And if we could do a nice ceremony, it would probably make the planet feel a bit better. Um, if the planet crashed into the sun, we would be able to see that. I don't know exactly what it would look like, but I imagine it would be quite impressive to look at. But depending on the planet, if it were something Earth or Mercury size, we're not really massive compared to the sun, so I don't expect there would be much of a consequence. Probably the more interesting thing would be how the planet got there in the first place and what happened as the planet planet approached the sun and now that could get very interesting because depending on the approach path that the planet took into the sun it could have some interesting effects for the other objects nearby because of its gravitational pull um but that has a lot of conditions in it and could get very fun next question pascal what would happen if jupiter or saturn were our moon oh that wouldn't work we are so small compared to Jupiter and Saturn, so um, we would end up being Jupiter's moon or Saturn's moon. The bigger body has more gravity, and so the smaller body orbits the bigger body. Um, but we could be their moons uh, under different circumstances if, if we had formed in a different part of the solar system, although if we'd formed out near Jupiter or Saturn, we would end up being one of their moons like, uh, say, Ganymede, which um, is the largest moon of Jupiter. Uh, but it is, even though Ganymede has liquid water under its surface, it doesn't have much of an atmosphere. Um, so I, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be us if we were there. Next question. Are there any more suns out there? So there are many, many, many stars. Our galaxy is formed of stars. And if you look up in the night sky, all of, all of those stars that you see, um, they can host planets. So we used to think that we were the only solar system. And then about 30 years ago now, 25 years ago, we started finding other planets. And that was great. Uh, and now we know of thousands of planets and of all different shapes and sizes, all different distances from their host stars. So those are the other suns that are out there. These are the other suns with other planets. Within our solar system, we just have our one sun. Uh, and that's good because that gives us nice, stable, predictable orbits. 
um, I think if we had multiple suns, then you would probably have to think harder about what the weather might be like on your birthday. Next up we have, um, if a black hole forms near the Earth, can the black hole swallow the Earth? I would think yes. If a black hole formed near the Earth, then that would not be good news for us. I'd be very interested into what triggered the formation though, because that would that's not likely to happen. Um, in order for a black hole to form, you need to have a point source of mass. And so when I say point source, like my fingertip is too big, it needs to be pointier and smaller. Um, so you need to have an awful lot of mass concentrated into a very teeny tiny spot, and then you'll get a black hole. So if a black hole formed near Earth, it would not be good news for us, but luckily that's not going to happen anytime soon. Next up, if there was no sun, what would happen? So if there were no sun, um, we wouldn't, if the sun had never existed, we wouldn't exist either because the protostellar nebula that formed the sun also formed the protoplanetary disk and that's what created the Earth. Um, through accretion, most likely, which is a process of smaller particles building into bigger particles, building into bigger particles too, and then gravitationally attracting even more. Um, so that's how we ended up with planetary formation. Um, and without the sun, we wouldn't have had that protoplanetary disk, so we would not have been around. Uh, if the sun, when at the end of its lifetime, the sun will probably turn into a red giant, so it will expand out, it will engulf Mercury, Venus, probably Earth too. Um, but the other planets will will go about in their orbits. Uh, it's just the the light that they get from the sun will be different. The conditions will be different. Um, and, and eventually it's not going to be much of an energy source. It's just going to be something that we orbit about. Shortly, I must say a massive thank, thank you First of all, to our moderators, we had Pascal, who was wonderfully uh, asking all the questions. Give us a wave, Pascal. Hey. And Izzy, who was also behind the scenes doing a lot of the work and doing some replies to you all as well. Give us a wave, Izzy. Thank you ever so much. And of course, a massive, 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 massive thank you to Dr. Leisha Ray for giving up her time in her busy schedule to come here and answer all your questions so beautifully. Thank you so much, Leisha, for coming. And thank you all for the excellent questions. It was, They were really good. So thank you. Thank you for watching. And I hope you enjoyed learning a little more about our amazing universe. Our team from Lancaster University also runs shows for schools, community groups, and more, both in person with our portable inflatable planetarium and online. But any in-person events are subject to current COVID restrictions. If you're a teacher, community group leader, or part of a similar educational organization, please do get in touch. We're particularly keen to make connections with those in our region of Lancashire and Cumbria, but we'd love to hear from you wherever you are. But for now, take care and keep learning more about the amazing wonders of our night sky. Thank you.